Welcome everyone to SCI and WHS, the Safe Communities Institute and Women in Homeland Security, Southern California's Lunch and Learn. Today, uh, we will be discussing equity on fire. And um, before we get started, I just would like to introduce our lovely WHS president, Miss Larissa Chiariki. And just thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Jesse, who actually holds two hats as Associate Director of USC Safe Communities Institute and as Director of Programs for Women in Homeland Security, Southern California. We're grateful to Jesse, Dr. Earl Southers and Safe Communities Institute for welcoming, welcoming us as a partner today. Safe Communities Institute is known for providing a forum for authentic dialogue, um, particularly around uh, race and advocating for justice. We thank uh, Jesse and Earl for providing us with this virtual room and the ability to create a safe space for our dialogue today. Women in Homeland Security Southern California was created in 2017 as a way for women in Homeland Security to come together and share their experiences. WHS SoCal is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to providing a platform for women in our industry to build relationships, grow in expertise, and contribute to philanthropic causes. Our network reaches over 600 women and some men. Our members represent a broad spectrum, including law enforcement, fire services, public health, emergency management, crisis management, cybersecurity and counterterrorism. Our interpretation of Homeland Security is inclusive of all fields that work towards keeping the American public safe and healthy. The three main pillars that form the foundation of WHS SoCal is that we network, we learn, and we give back. Our goal is to make the journey as a woman in the field of Homeland Security, emergency management, and public safety a positive one. We hold events such as this to foster a collaborative environment for an industry professionals to learn about the discipline and build connections to better understand the roles of public and private sector practitioners in the prevention, protection, and response to any type of incident. Women in Homeland Security Southern California is dedicated to providing a safe space for women to have authentic dialogues about the workplace. In fact, we will soon be launching our mentorship program, which is helped by the wonderful Brenda Rodriguez. The purpose of the mentorship program is to provide professional women a forum to increase their knowledge, networking, and representation through connection and relationship building, which will help them reach their professional milestones and further success for all women leaders. We've also created a new position on our board, Director of Advocacy, which is helmed by Jackie Kochi Tamayo. WHS SoCal Advocacy works to uplift, unify, and champion for women by advocating, raising awareness, and supporting policy that aligns with the mission of WHS SoCal. And it is through our advocacy efforts that we have met our featured philanthropy organization for December, Equity on Fire. But I would be remiss if I did not thank um, an organization that has been with us with, with WHS SoCal from the very beginning, our silver sponsor, Community Outreach Promoting Emergency Preparedness and Be More Prepared a nonprofit volunteer emergency preparedness organization, Be More Prepared to Cope for Emergency Survival Preparedness. COPE provides disaster donation management service by working with non-government community stakeholder sectors to obtain in-kind donations of supplies, equipment, and services that provide critical emergency preparedness support services. For more information, we encourage you to please visit their website at atasteofpreparedness.com. I met our featured speakers through WHS SoCal, and I was immediately blown away by their intelligence, their wit, and their passion. We all agreed that we wanted to provide them with a platform and a microphone to tell their stories. Each speaker will tell their story, and then we will open it up for Q&A. It is my true pleasure to introduce you to our featured speakers today. Chief Chris Larson is a 31-year veteran of the Los Angeles City Fire Department and currently holds the rank of Battalion Chief. She was the first African-American woman promoted to the rank of Captain 1, Captain 2, and Battalion Chief in the department's history. Chief Larson holds a BA from UCLA in sociology and a master's in public service leadership with an emphasis in emergency management from Capella University. She currently serves as president of Los Angeles Women in the Fire Service and vice president on the board of Camp Blaze. In her current role, she is in charge of recruitment and youth programs for LAFD. Captain Lauren Andrade is a native San Diegan where she currently resides with her two young sons. Captain Andrade was a division one collegiate basketball player at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo where she graduated with a BA in English. Her career started in the fire service at Poe Way Fire Department in San Diego County. 
In 2008, she was hired by Orange County Fire Authority as a firefighter paramedic. Her professional experience includes working as a fire apparatus engineer on the heavy rescue, a member of Urban Search and Rescue California Task Force 5, a part-time helicopter rescuer for the technical rescue truck program, and currently a fire captain paramedic in Garden Grove on an engine company. Captain Andrade began her work as an advocate for change after she gave birth to her son, Luke. Upon returning to work, she realized that her department was out of compliance and had no lactation accommodations in addition to not having adequate women's restroom facilities in all stations. In the last four years, Captain Andrade has collaborated with um, ACLU SoCal, or American Civil Liberties Union, Southern California, to ensure proper restroom facilities and lactation accommodations in all of Orange County Fire Authority fire stations. She continues to advocate for fairness in policy, practice, and procedure within her department, as well as other departments within the region, and you can actually catch her debut on Netflix, and we will be sharing that link later. Uh, Rebecca Ninberg has been serving as a fire commissioner for the City of LA since 2015. In this role, she has worked extensively to improve the recruitment and retention of diverse candidates, specifically women, by leading multiple strategic planning sessions with the women of LA. LA Fire Department and offering policy recommendations to improve recruitment and address the systemic racism, sexism, discrimination that have plagued the department. Most recently, Rebecca has helped establish the Women's Fire Alliance, a cross-agency organization for female firefighters dedicated to improving the recruitment, retention, and promotion of females in the fire service throughout Southern California. Rebecca, this is my favorite part. Rebecca is also the co-founder of the Los Angeles Derby Dolls and has served as a C CEO for 12 years. Prior to that work, Rebecca was a member of the Sculptors Union Local 755 and worked in the motion picture industry for over a decade. She received her bachelor's degree from UCLA in fine arts. Welcome to our speakers. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Larson. I'm a battalion chief with the Los Angeles Fire Department and president of Los Angeles Women in the Fire Service. One of the reasons that I chose to become a member of Equity on Fire was because there were a lot of inequities that we see across the fire service, not just with the city of Los Angeles, but broadly across the nation. Um, times need to change for some of the issues that the women face within fire service across the United States. Um, we've seen issues that we've helped people with, with the lactation policies, restroom policies, um, just gender and harassment issues. So while this is an issue, some of these issues are faced within the Los Angeles City Fire Department, they're also faced broadly across the United States. Um, roughly 4% of women firefighters is across the United States. That number hasn't changed in 45 years. So something needs to change. Um, messaging for young girls, options for women as they're getting out of college or out of high school, um, they need to be trained that this is a viable career for them. It's a career that is extremely rewarding. It's a career that I'm grateful for, um, but it is a career where women still do feel harassed. They experience it. Um, there's barriers to um, opportunities for promotion, depending upon what organization you work in. Um, I think for me, when, when I first came out of the drill tower, I had the drill master tell me, uh, just he and I in the middle of the drill tower, so there's no witnesses. You know, Chris, what kind of woman do you want to be on this fire department? And while I wasn't exactly sure what he meant, the message was clear, which was keep your mouth shut, do what you're told, and, and you'll have a good career. Um, it's time that we stop messaging that to the women that are getting on the fire service. The diversity that women bring to the fire service is immeasurable. Um, they bring a diversity of thought and ideas. And it is well known that the more heterogeneous the me members in a room are making decisions, the better off those decisions are made. So I thank you for the opportunity to discuss some ideas today. And um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. My name is Lauren Andrade, I'm fire captain uh, for Orange County Fire Authority. Just want to say I'm not uh, speaking in any way, shape or form uh, for the organization today, just, just representing myself. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for uh, having me. You know, what's awesome about women in Homeland Security, I remember when I was first tackling um, trying to get women's restroom, it's restrooms in all of our fire stations for our women firefighters. When I first promoted to captain, I went to a lunch and uh, uh, put on by women in Homeland Security. And since then, 
Um, they have continued to help advocate for me, uh, wrote, wrote letters uh, to uh, executive management saying that they supported uh, the work um, that uh, I was attempting to do to get the restrooms put in. Um, I've been in the fire service for approximately 18 years now. I did start uh, four years in Poway and then uh, moved up to uh, Orange County Fire Authority, where um, I did uh, hold the position of firefighter paramedic as well as uh, engineer on a ladder truck, uh, heavy rescue, and then uh, promoted up to fire captain. It wasn't until I was a fire captain that it was brought to my attention that um, some of our stations didn't have women's restrooms or shower facilities. Um, as you all know, um, you know, we deal with uh, COVID and, um, you know, uh, uh, blood and uh, carcinogens, uh, depending on, you know, what it is that we're going on. Um, it's really important that we have, uh, that people aren't waiting to get that stuff off of their bodies. Um, so uh, once I started looking into it, it wasn't just one restroom at station 13 uh, that they didn't have adequate facilities, but it was actually 17 of our fire stations. Um, at that point, uh, I did address executive management. Um, and I, you know, frankly, I think they thought it was a good idea. It was just going to be too much money um, at that point. Um, and uh, that's when it was like, hey, yeah, we do need to do this. Not sure when it's going to happen. Um, at that point, um, that's when I kind of started reaching out and uh, to external resources. And fortunately, um, uh, a gal uh, connected me with the ACLU and they, I was fortunate enough for them to take my case. Um, you know, they don't do that. Um, I, I feel like I kind of won the lottery with them. Um, and then, you know, once we ended up meeting up with the ACLU, um, <clears throat> they were, uh, they found the resources um, to make it happen. And I think uh, basically what I learned from that was, um, you know, fire departments, at least my fire department, just they didn't want to move uh, on that. And but once you actually brought it outside the organization and provided the awareness that, yeah, this, in fact, isn't we don't have these facilities that is that are federal law. And you're actually going to have some accountability there um, that, you know, you won't actually get the change, even for something as rudimentary as restrooms. So um, uh, while I got brought in. Um, for the administrative assignment to put in restrooms, um, a friend of mine, uh, Desiree Horton, who was our first uh, woman fire pilot, um, gave me a call. Uh, she, is, she has been a 30-year fire pilot, 15 years um, in fire, more experienced than any of our, our other fire pilots that we had. Um, and she called me and she said, I'm going to get fired. And I said, uh, what makes you think that? Like, was, was she just nervous? I didn't understand, you know, where she was coming from. This is a woman that has, is very well known within the fire community all over the state. Um, and she said, no, I just have this feeling they're going to let me go. Um, I, I asked if there was any documentation supporting that, um, that she had seen. No, um, you know, long story short, they ended up um, firing her. Um, this is somebody that, you know, had again more fire experience than any other fire uh, pilot that we had. Um, there was zero documentation showing that she um, had failed anything, no check flights. Um, all of her evaluations were uh, standard and above. Um, I didn't I did not see, you know, what was actually going on except for the fact that there was a lot of turmoil about the fact that a woman fire pilot was coming into air operations. We had not had one yet. Um, and really in any rank, we didn't have a, a paramedic rescuer that was a woman. We didn't have a pilot. We didn't have a crew chief that was a woman. So um, knowing the backstory and then also knowing that, you know, uh, one of our uh, firefighters, Dwayne Patman, actually, he's a black firefighter that, um, some of the same uh, chiefs that were captains at the time basically did the same thing to him, um, fired him without documentation. He ended up suing and, um, you know, settling out of the case. But I guess just kind of through this whole thing, um, it kind of really became apparent to me that we've got a really big problem um, that, you know, 
with fire departments, you know, they are, we have the public trust, which is great, but frankly, we've taken advantage of it. And if, you know, if this is, if Desiree Horton, who has 30 years on the job can just get fired without any documentation, and we continue to pay out settlements without actually changing the problem or looking at it, um, then, you know, we're, we're not in very good shape. Um, also too, you know, as far as something as rudimentary as the facilities, the, the bathrooms, um, there's multiple, uh, LA County doesn't have women's restrooms. Um, Oakland fire doesn't have women's restrooms. Um, there's, uh, you know, it kind of goes nationwide, unfortunately, um, these issues. So, um, that was kind of the, the why we decided to, um, start equity, equity on fire. Um, and that's kind of, you know, where we landed today. So, um, Really, really happy to be here and um, look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you so much, Captain Andrade. And thank you so much, Chief Larson. I first want to commend you both for the work that you're doing and that you have done. Um, and to get to the positions that you're in took extraordinary tenacity. I mean, and you are, I will say, just knowing you both, you are superheroes, um, both personally and professionally. So I am Im so impressed with what you've done in your careers. And, uh, and watching you do this work is also quite impressive as well. So um, I wanted to ask, you know, and you touched on this, Chief Larson, um, about diversity in fire in uh, fire departments. I had a woman who came up to me from San Diego Fire, and she said that she had come up on an incident, or she had gone to an incident, and the paramedic there was that was there on um, testing this woman's vitals it was really unstable. And the moment this woman, she said that the, he was testing her vitals. And when she put, came over and put her hand on the woman and started talking with her, that she stabilized immediately. And she said, you know, and, and a lot of women that I've spoken with have said, you know, I, I believe that, but there's no data, you know, there's no studies on this. But I want to ask you both, why do you think it's so important? Because I can see, you know, just anecdotally, it's important. But why do you think it's so important to have more diversity in your fire departments and in the fire service in general? I think what's important to understand is that, you know, especially in a city like Los Angeles, it's very diverse. And, and cities across the country are not as, as homogeneous as everybody thinks they are. And so when they're looking at first responders, police or fire, they're looking for somebody that looks like them, that maybe can speak their language, um, and, and kind of has an understanding of who they are as a person in the situation they're going through. Um, I think we take for granted the fact that um, firefighters are some of the most empathetic people there are um, because of what we deal with on a daily basis, seeing people at their worst. Um, but knowing that, um, having that diversity of thoughts and ideas, not only in a fire station, but in the management uh, rank, is going to allow us to bring different thoughts, different ideas, um, give that more broad perspective of an issue. There may be somebody that we don't know, and it could be a firefighter, it could be an officer, right, that has institutional knowledge of a certain area. Well, we need to tap into that and not um, discard the information that they're giving us based on the fact that, oh, they're just a firefighter, they're not an officer. Um, because those ideas, whatever ideas they are that are good ideas, are worth investigating. And I think for too long, the fire service has done business as usual, which is we hire the same people um, all the time with the same thought process. Um, I think, you know, LAFD has gotten away with that. Our department has gotten way more diverse um, over the course of at least my tenure. Um, but we have a ways to go, at least as far as getting women, um, Asians and African-Americans. But I think once we can start to bring those other people in, it only allows us to better serve the department. Um, it gets better ideas. 
um, generated for what are best policies and practices. And it, for the first time, it can allow us to get away from, well, this is always the way we've done it. So we're going to continue to do it that way. I think we get stuck in that. We get stuck in the tradition of things as a fire service. And it's time to reinvent ourselves a little bit and use some of the better practices from business to make us move forward as a, as a group across the nation, not just in Southern California. Yeah, I right. I I think definitely looking just because there's so few fires in the fire service that have um, reformed. I think you're right. Looking at external um, organizations and Lauren, any comments? Yeah, I mean, that? I think exactly what the chief said. I mean, uh, frankly, you know, we want to hold on to this archetype, right? Um, in the '80s, the numbers haven't changed military, Marines, and they all have more women in the fire service. Uh, they're, they're well more integrated. I think Marines are like eight and a half percent now, where, where women in fire are 4%. If you actually look at what the job is that we do, 96% are medical aides. That means a nurse in the ER actually could, could handle 96% and have a higher license than what I have, you know, as a, as a paramedic. That is real. People don't want to advertise that. They don't want to look at it. Every time you go on the website, you know, it's always like, hey, fighting fire, doing it, you know, catching babies, swinging from windows, right? That's not it. That's not it. We actually need to take away the image and look at the job and hire for the job. And yes, part of that is firefighting. And yes, is it heroic? Yes, on a certain level. But Something, it's not quite as specialized as we like to think that it is. Um, yes, it requires strength. Do women have the strength? Yes. So do our trans, you know, folks. So do our Black folks, right? Like, why, why haven't we brought those in? There are systemic barriers that are lacking oversight from um, a department level. And it's frankly because they've never had to look at it because look at our politicians. They get those platinum endorsements, right? They, they, they want to get married to those unions. And this is, this is what's real. They want to make sure that they're going to secure that public, that image, that public trust, right? Until we decide to really look at it like they did with police a while back and really look at what reform is going to look like. and. Um, start hiring, really prioritizing and making significant efforts to bring in uh, diverse applicants. Again, like, like Chief was saying, in an emergency situation, you want as many resources as possible. If it's somebody miscarrying, if it's a car accident, if it's you know a medical aid that I'm going on in Garden Grove, right? And I can't speak Vietnamese right? How am I going to really connect with this person that's, that's in their worst moment, right? We have to do a better job of providing our public with the service that they need, not the image we want to maintain. Okay. So, so, the, so the barriers for change, you're saying, have been because the military, so the Marines are at 8%. Uh, PDs are ranging 15 to 20 percent. Um, military overall is about 17. Um, the barriers for change you're saying are the archetype and um, the, pu the public trust that there's no oversight. Well, and there's also just the general stereotypes that we have of this being a non-traditional job that women shouldn't are not qualified for. And, and it goes back, I mean, it goes farther back to gender socialization as a young child. I mean, if you don't know that this is a career opportunity for you, you might see a fire truck as a little girl, but if you're not seeing a girl on the fire truck, you don't see it as a viable career opportunity. So it, it goes way back. And then it also becomes about inclusion. How do once the, those people come to the, the department, how do we make them feel included, welcome, um, bring them on and, and support them, not just in the first year, but throughout their career with training and classes and, and camaraderie that will inspire them to, to feel like 
this is truly their family and this is truly um, a career that is a viable option for them and that provides them the career growth that they aspire to, not what they're told that they can have. You know, you got to wait X time before you promote, oh, you don't want to be in that position. You can't do this. Um, and we have to change that can't to what, what is it that you want to do with your career? So a lot of it is just changing the narrative, but part of it is getting that message out early to young girls, to communities that are historically underrepresented within an or the fire service to say, hey, this is a viable career option. We want you, we welcome you, um, come join our family. So it, it's, it takes a long time. You can't, it's not something you can change overnight but it is changeable. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it took a long time to get here and it's going to take a long time to um, to reform as well. Although, I mean, there are ways certainly of um, attacking this. And I saw that on your website that you are focused on three goals. Um, it says educating the public, via multimedia awareness campaigns, creating a support structure for those who wish to come forward to speak their truth, and supporting legal and political vehicles to ensure long-term institutional change. Um, can you speak to these strategies and how they work together? Um, yeah, so definitely, you know, it, it, it's kind of like what the chief said, you know, everybody, if you look on pretty much most people's website, most departments website, it says diversity, and it gives you this whole thing. but Really, those are just words on a page, right? That's just that's just to make it look good. They're actually, when it comes down to it, um, and you're you talk to the people first of all, the no trans firefighters that we have because we don't have any trans firefighters at OCFA. I'm pretty sure LAFD doesn't either. Just since these are the two agencies here, we have no out gay males at OCF in Orange County Fire. I don't know how many of you guys have, but you know it, it's those types. I think. We don't have a black woman firefighter for Christ's sakes, right? So it's one thing to talk about it, and you can't tell me black women aren't, you know, capable to do this job, right? There's plenty, right? But the reality is, once they get into the door, and you're, you know, you get them in in academy, they'll, you know, do great, whatever, and then you throw them out into this culture where they're not included. It's the brotherhood and the stepsisters, right? And, and that stepsister can be anybody that's different, right? So this is a top-down issue. Leadership, fire, I, I really, truly believe this can shift, and it's going to shift. You know, big problems, big change. But it's our responsibility as officers to stop being like, oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's not really there. This doesn't really happen when we have rookies that are, you know, experiencing some of this stuff, that are being bullied, harassed. You know, when you have a culture that it's exactly right. Okay, this is a perfect example. Um, this is, you know, a, a fire captain from uh, LAFD. They're retired. Those are retired. Yeah, that, that I don't know, that those are retired firefighters. Okay, well, still, the culture is still there where there is, I mean, I can find, I can pull up uh, Fire Station 64 that had, you know, Proud Boy Fire Department, Fire Station 64. This was a recent thing that I was sent by somebody at Los Angeles Fire Department with the don't the Gadsden flag on a fire engine, which is property. Nobody's doing anything about it, right? This is what I'm talking about, about the leadership issue that we're having. You know, some guy, you know, somebody served paperwork, a vaccine. I was reading in the LA Times the other day. Um, an LAFD a black fire chief was giving somebody paperwork about a vaccination mandate, and the gentleman dropped his pants and wiped his butt. The fact that he is still employed blows my mind. So again, this is we have a, a problem with holding people accountable within. So as far as the structure goes, and I'm going to get back to that. He's on it. I will say he is on administrative leave. So I do want to clarify, he is on administrative leave. Um, so, he, and, and I'm again, I'm just using LAFD has been in the in the paper. We've we've got plenty of the same stuff going on in, in Orange County. So, I mean, not the exact same, but similar. Um, 
What percent of women are in your department and what percent are African-American are in OCFA? Oh, we have no African-American women and we have 2%. And that's after recruitment. 2%? Uh, recruitment, yeah. 2% um, female or African-American? Uh, we have um, less African-Americans than we have women. I know that. And what so, percent women do you have? Uh, 2.4 was the last. Okay. 2.4, yeah. Okay, 2.4%. And Chief Larson, what percent in LAFD? For women is... Uh, 3.53% and African American is just under 15%. Okay. Right around 15%. Okay. Can I speak really quick back to the, the structure that we were, because I kind of like went off on a tangent there, but um, I really do, again, believe that there is possibility for change. And that's kind of what Equity on Fire wanted to do, right? First and foremost, we have to provide awareness. People don't know that, you know, LA County. So I talked to people that you know, live in LA, like, oh, well, they don't have that here, not LAFD, but LA County fire. They don't have uh, women's restrooms. There. I just got a fire uh, call from a fire chief in Oakland. Same thing. Don't have restrooms here. How do we, you know, what kind of legal stuff? And, and fortunately, we can network and kind of do that, right? Um, again, also explaining to people why, well, how come more women firefighters, Black firefighters aren't speaking out? Because they will be retaliated against. Because the systems in place um, will take the information, water it down, and the rumors will spread. And that will affect them more. That, and they'll just take whatever it is than speaking out. Speaking out is killing the you know, oath of the, you know, don't tell on your brothers you know, type of thing. So um, that's a big, a big part of it. So what we try to do is provide if somebody is being harassed, discriminated against, that kind of thing. We provide a support structure for them um, to where we um, get together, we kind of find out what the issues are, how to best lead them through that process. A lot of it is, you know, if they need to report it to HR, if they need to make police reports, we've had people that, you know, we've had to help them go make police reports um, um, to do that. So again, providing that structure and then you know, a legal and political strategy really to move this forward on a higher level, right? Like ultimately we want impact, like imp we need to impact it on a national, well, state level, right? But in order to do that, like how they did in, in uh, you know, LA uh, PD, right? They had the Christopher Commission, ultimately a consent, a consent decree, where they're going to really just have to look at every system and reform it because the way it is now um, is not working. <laughs> and have you, um, I know it is, um, right, because I will say that in LAFD, uh, they had the, they had reform efforts. Uh, certainly they were, you know, in the seventies uh, when they opened it up to, um, finally opened it up to Latinos. Um, and then I think in the nineties as well, there was a reform attempt, HRDC and same in 2008. However, you know, the problems still persist um, as we, as we see. Uh, since you've started this organization, have you seen any changes in your departments? Uh, Chief Larson. Well, I think change is slow to come in a lot of different areas, but I think um, one of the things that um, uh, past board of LAWFS had pushed for was an organizational assessment. So finally, that has been completed about four years past when it was supposed to be done. But it's given us, because it included um, both foreign and civilian, and included some insights that um, I, did, I don't think I was aware of. Um, and it shows work that obviously needs to be done. Um, but it's starting to move the needle forward. I think the biggest challenge that we'll have is getting out of our own way as far as how quickly will we adopt any changes with this new HR bureau that we have coming and how willing the membership are to work together to really make those changes. If we give them the things that they're asking for, are they really going to be receptive to, to what they put in that assessment? Um, we saw certain ranks, uh, apparatus operators who weren't really happy. We saw that we had a lack of engagement between members with 11 to 15 years on. How do we re-engage those members? How do we give the captains the soft skills training that they wanted? 
Um, if we can give that to the membership, it's not only going to increase morale, it's going to increase engagement. It's retention is really hasn't been a problem for us, but it hopefully will motivate more people to try to promote within the organization, step forward and 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 be part of a, a big productive uh, change within the department that I don't think we've seen since I've been on. Um, and I think it's it's one of those things that it starts small, you know, like a snowball. And as it moves downhill, it gets bigger. Um, and hopefully when, when that happens, it's getting bigger and it's because it's be, being embraced by the, the whole department. And it's not just a little group here and a little group there, that it incorporates everybody within the organization from the top down, from the bottom up, and everybody in between so that the issues that we have, we can say, hey, we've put in a, a not a Band-Aid, but a resolution to resolve this issue. Um, going forward, this will be something that's continued um, and it's not just a one-off thing to satisfy a lawsuit or a mandate because we did something wrong. You know, somebody was harassed. Okay, now you got to do five years of sexual harassment training. No, these are broad-based um, programs that are embedded within the institution in the fabric of, of the fire department itself. Excellent. So that that's great that you got that organizational study done. Um, that's and I um, and Lauren, uh, Captain Andrade, have you seen any changes in OCFA um, since you started, or any other organizations since you started? Yeah, um, absolutely. We um, again uh, with help from the ACLU, um, we were able to. Um, you know, motivate the department to start with the restroom. So we did actually, um, we're, we broke ground on uh, two of those, I believe. Um, we did uh, put in lactation accommodations in every single uh, fire station for uh, the women. Um, and, you know, but you'd be surprised that, you know, the kickback that you would get just for putting a placard on, a, you know, a dorm saying, hey, if somebody is lactating, that they can use this room to pump. You know, I think uh, it was it was a little bit surprising. Uh, we're also working on some policy um, as far as uh, for our lactation uh, policy. And then ultimately, um, so there's there's definitely some things in the works. And like uh, the chief said, it is going to be um, slow going. Um, but again, big problems, big change. So it's like, you know, you might think, you know, yeah, it's pushing water uphill. Uh, but, you know, it's it. It needs to happen and it will happen. So it's it, you can kind of see it as overwhelming because you can see it as huge opportunity. Well, and I'd, I'd also like to say, too, that, you know, since Lauren and I have been talking about this and working on this, you know, people have heard word from us that we're doing this and organizations have reached out. Like the Oakland issue was uh, an Oakland firefighter who reached out to me because she knew me. I don't I'm not the bathroom expert. I pass it off to, to Lauren. So we're also kind of a clearinghouse for women that are suffering from these issues that somebody else might know the answer to, somebody else might have a better strategy for. So it's also a way that we can help women in smaller departments across the country um, reach out to, to start making the changes in their organizations that they realize um, they're behind on or that they need, um, because we don't necessarily all have to reinvent the wheel. We can take the best practices and policies from people who already have them and let them make them their own um, to their own organization. And, and that just is better for everybody all, all around. Excellent, excellent. So that is, that's uh, phenomenal that people are reaching out to you from other agencies. Um, I know that you both have been fairly public lately. I, will, I do wanna commend you both for your courage, um, for, for, talking about these issues, being able to have these conversations, and also uh, thank you for the support you're offering um, other women in and uh, minorities in other departments as well, because this is a national problem. Um, so I think it's time, thank you both so much. I think it's time for q and I We have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, they. Um, Lauren, you mentioned police reform can be a model for fire services. Can you speak more about that and what practices fire 
might adopt. And both of you jump in anytime. I'm just going to ask these questions um, as well. I think, yeah, I mean, I think uh, what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of times the people that generally are in our executive management are raised within the fire department, right? So what they have seen and practiced worked for them the best, right? So least likely to want to change it, basically. So if you're going to really look at a system, I think, you know, having a third party um, assessment, I think is fantastic. Uh, best uh, policies, practices, procedures and come in and actually really look at it. I know one of the things that we did is we got an audit of our tower and actually found out that, you know, we were making it harder than what it needed to be. And we were losing applicants that way. Right. So I just think taking it outside of what is within, it takes the pressure off of management because they don't want to stand up to the rank and file either. A lot of the times it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and um, and uh, again, with the union pressure as well, that's a that's another that's another battle you've got going on. But so what I do, think what do you mean by that? Um, I guess what I'm saying is there's there's barriers to change, right? Like there's a lot of meet and confer, like say uh, executive management wanted to do make a change. They have to confer with the union, right? Like, so there's, there's a lot of different levels. Um, but I just think taking something outside. So it's not one, you know, like the union's opinion, or it's not executive management to say, Hey, this is what is, um, I think it needs to be on every single level. I think from you, I think overall, if we look at what the job is today, not what it was, it was 50 years ago, what it is today, and then you restructure it from there as far as making the job requirements actually reflect the job that we do, then uh, I think we'll be in a, in a much better place. And again, I think a lot, you have to bring civilians into the mix. I think. Anytime you have something where, uh, for example, HR is in-house or people are investigating things, it needs to take that outside the department. You can't have, there's there's too many factors there. Um, and I, I just think there needs to be more civilian oversight. Excellent. Um, and I, I'm gonna answer a couple of these pretty quickly uh, just because they're here. Um, by restrooms, would this include shower facilities? Yes. Yes, LAFD, and just know that LAFD um, did this back when? Well, Chief we Mark? did it in the mid '90s. Okay, right. So yeah. all of all of LAFD's uh, facilities have uh, uh, gendered restrooms. Yeah. Um, Lucky, and the, that does include. <laughs> I know, uh, and are there state national funding sources for restroom additions conversions in the fire stations? city county fire that they can apply for do you know about that i don't know i don't know if there's any <clears throat> those are those are capital improvement projects that are usually have to be incorporated into the budget of either the city or the department agency that that uh is working on the, the upgrade but it is federal law it's required so you got to find a way to do it yeah <laughs> I, I don't know all the ins and outs as far as like that part goes um yeah uh, that's a great question. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, um, I thought this was really interesting and I had remembered somebody in the mayor's office back in, you know, when I first started had mentioned about starting in battalions and whatnot, but not specifically this, she said, would forming an opt-in all female station in large departments help to develop a harassment-free leadership pipeline as an interim to all fire stations having appropriate facilities. I don't know if you have enough women in Orange County. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know that like separating people out, you know what I mean, is, is really the thing. I think you go into other workplaces um, and everybody works together. You look at medicine, right? Let's just take medicine. Before, you know, in the, you know, along whatever, 50 years ago, there weren't a lot of, you know, women doctors, right? Now it's like you go in and you don't even think twice about it, right? So, I mean, it's, I think it's, I really do believe it's a matter of the leadership saying, hey, this is what we're doing now. Get on board or you can go somewhere else, right? Like that's it, the end. And I feel like a, a really, um, you know, a lot of firefighters, the reason why we're having the cultural problem we are is because of that dominant culture is still holding on to this 
that archetype we were talking about of this homogenous 6'3", white cis firefighter, right? And that's still the dominant culture, right? It's it's what we need to, if the dominant culture is going to say, hey, we're including all of our people, okay? It's not just, this isn't what it needs to look like. This isn't what it has been, right? This is what we are, and this is what we're going to tolerate. I mean, as we can see, there hasn't been a lot of like, uh, accountability for people doing the, like, I know I talked to a black firefighter that had a monkey put in, um, their, uh, gear room, right? Like, what does that tell you? You know, I mean, that's just absolutely, you know, horrifying to me. So, um, again, it needs to be something that's not tolerated. And I think a couple examples of like, Hey, you did this, you're gone. You know, Hey, you did this, uh, you know, you, violating these types of things and showing that bullying and harassing is not going to be tolerated. You know, then, then I think we'll start seeing some changes, but up to this point, many fire chiefs don't want to do that. I would say sadly, you know, and I don't understand why within, within my organization is since we've been hiring in 2013, every single class has graduated women. So all of a sudden now for there to be such a backlash and, and for women to still be feeling bullied um, is, is sad because, you know, how did all of a sudden these, this group that was this cohesive class when they graduated, all of a sudden they get away from some of the women that they were working with. And now all of a sudden they're not qualified. I guarantee they all went through the same hell having, having taught at the fire academy. I know what they went through. It, it was it was difficult, and that bond of their class should stand, regardless of what the outsiders are saying. Um, those women earned that spot in this department, and they should be applauded for that instead of belittled for it. Um, so we have to change that dynamic and change that thought process again of inclusion instead of you know trying to conquer and divide. Well, I, I think you're, I mean, I, and I can definitely speak to that. I mean, I, I, first 10 years of, you know, being on the fire department, like I didn't really want to work with other women because I didn't want them to make me look bad or I want to be compared to them. Right. Like that was my mindset. The guys liked me, whatever that meant, you know? So, I mean, you, in these oppressive, and if you read about like, you know, these, you know, oppressive type work environments where they're, you know, uh, singling out people or, you know, um, there's a dominant group and, you know, subordinate group, like these are, these are very common things to do, right? Like they separate themselves from other women. I'll never forget. I was trying to, um, start, um, a women's organization. We had very few, few women when we were dealing with the bathroom situation. And I said, you know, I'd like to speak as a collective group. And many of them are like, man, I want to do that, but I am terrified. I am terrified. And why? To, to make a women's organization, I said, why? Because they're, they've already told me to, you know, they said, you know, distance yourself from Lauren because, you know, she's organizing whatever that means, you know, to get bathrooms for Christ's sakes. But it's that type of intimidation, right? Is that type of keep them separate, you know, so that, you know, uh, and again, I fell victim. Like I, I was, I get it. The acceptance of the crew and trying to be a part of something that you never really are going to be part of, but you just don't get that yet is, is why, is why they distance themselves. Because you know what, what happened in the Academy, that was a long time ago. Than what is in their everyday life, and many of them, you know, especially now, are spending more time in the fire stations than they are in their own houses. I um, there's so many questions I want to answer. <laughs> Do you all have like a couple more hours? It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is uh, so uh, because we're running out of time. I have two questions, um, and one of them is these: What are your top three? What are your top three goals you would like to achieve? for 2022 when it comes to equity? And I'm gonna ask you both that. Well, I think for me, I think one of the things that's important is that um, we really open our minds to what it can be. 
and not what it what we think it can be um, or what we think it is. Um, as far as our department, <clears throat> you know, diversity, equity, inclusion is a whole brand new paradigm for us, um, and so it's gonna it's gonna require a lot of a, a heavy lift for us to to get this and get it engaged. As far as equity on fire, I mean, our goal is to keep supporting these women that are in smaller organizations that don't feel that they have a voice. They don't know who to talk to um, and they don't know where to turn and, and they find us and they realize that um, things can get better. It's difficult. It's a long road and it's not easy, but the challenge it is worth it in the end because like what we're hoping to do is we make organizational change and, and they can too. And, you know, I honestly hope that we get out of COVID in 2022. <laughs> That's my other thing. That's my, my, That's I mean, I know we're probably going to have to live with yeah. it, but I'm, I'm, I'm so over COVID. That's, That's <laughs> I know. It's not good. Uh, uh, Captain Andrade. I feel like ever since Equity on Fire, we, it was kind of, you know, as we brought this forward, it was basically out of need. Um, there were, we're getting inundated with like stories all over the country. Um, and I think for me, first and foremost, um, supporting the women and black firefighters, trans, whoever is having issues. And, you know, especially with discrimination, and underrepresented groups, um, supporting them, figuring out a way to help, you know, making sure each one has a battle buddy. I love that uh, a gal uh, mentioned that she's from uh, the forest service and, you know, she's, she's the battle buddy for somebody going through some really hard things and how we can, you know, uh, help those victims that are really being vic victimized and taken advantage of to, you know, empower them for them to be able to move through this process and come out the other side and realize they can stand on their own two feet. I think, that's a big one. And, and just trying to figure out how to do that. I think obviously um, I know for me, um, the more I find out about this, uh, all the different issues um, I want a legal strategy in order to move things forward on more of either a state or national level. Um, there's a lot of um, different groups that do stuff like that, but really more some kind of impact litigation where we're going to able to really uh, affect change through policy, because that's where it's at. Because the second this goes away, or Chief Larson retires, you got to hope not. Um, but you know, you know, seriously, what happens then? Who's going to? And often, what happens if it's not policy, policy and procedure starts to backslide, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think. The, the goals for Equity on Fire will, will continue to move and change, um, but I think that those are kind of what I'm looking at. It's interesting uh, that, that I know we might go over, but um, there's, sorry, there's a question um, that says, how do we go beyond women feeling welcomed to feeling valued? In Minneapolis, we've gone from 17% to 7%. Um, and they talk about some issues and what can be incorporated to create an attitude of value of the women, for women, of the women. So um, that, like when you were saying it, backslides is like creating an attitude of value. Um, and where do you think that would come from? Fire chief. Yeah, that, that's a leadership thing. And, and you know. Um, All of this it, is a leadership thing. It, it's a leadership thing and it starts at the top, but it also has right. to be embedded in the fabric of, of the organization. So it can't just be the fire chief. It's got to be his deputy chiefs, his assistant chiefs, his battalion chiefs, however the, the, the department chooses to phrase that, um, so that it doesn't matter who's walking into a fire station or who's speaking at an event, that attitude of diversity and inclusion is brought up no matter where that person is. Um, it, it goes to seeing somebody at the gym that you think might be a good firefighter or in the supermarket, um, because you know, you're a firefighter, you can recruit anywhere. Um, and so it's, it's getting it out there and it's, it, it's, it's more than putting it in your core values, your mission statement, your vision statement. It's about making sure that everybody in the organization has that value within them. And otherwise, Lauren's right. It, it backslides. And we've seen that millions and millions of times across the country. It always happens. 
right? Yeah, and oh, I, oh I, we have to stop really quickly. Wait a second, really super fast. What can everybody on this call do to help you? Got it. Five seconds. Okay, go to equityonfire.org. Scroll down. You can put in your information or just follow. And we have Twitter, Facebook, right? All those things. Get us your information and we will have action items that you can do. Uh, we will put you to work if you want to. The reality is, if you want to really affect change in this way, we are doing that. And we will allow you or not allow you. We will really, we could really capitalize on, on people that want to affect change and show up. So that would be wonderful. Also, if somebody put, wants to put my number in the chat, I'm happy. You can text me. Totally happy. Or I'll put my number in the chat. Okay. Um, and Chief Larson, five seconds, 30 seconds, because we got to oh. hand it off to Larissa. So I, I think Equity on Fire is, is a group that, that really does want to make change in the fire service, not just here in Southern California, but across the nation. Um, it, it's time for the fire service to come up with a different paradigm, um, a paradigm of inclusion and opportunity for everybody, no matter who you are. Um, and so I hope that going forward, um, you know, we're able to help institute policies that um, last for a lifetime and, and move the fire service really into the 21st century. That's, that's my goal. Excellent. Well, thank you both so, so much. I want to commend you both uh, for your courage. And, um, and I want to thank Women in Homeland Security for your support and hosting such uh, incredible leaders here today. So thank you so much. Um, I love Women in Homeland Security. Uh, you've been such great, a, a incredible organization uplifting women across public safety. Um, so, and I'm going to hand it off to Larissa. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, thank you, Captain Andrade, Chief Larson, and Commissioner Ninberg. You um, you are an inspiration on a daily basis for me personally, but also for women in Homeland Security. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the three pillars of women in Homeland Security Southern California is we give back. And so here is um, our philanthropy organization that we are highlighting for the month of December, Equity on Fire. And there's their website, equityonfire.org, as um, Captain Andrade mentioned. If you'd like to become more involved in women in homeland security, there are lots of opportunities to volunteer. We need committee members for membership, mentorship programs, which are the events that we hold, public affairs, sponsorship, philanthropy, and advocacy. If you're interested, please contact us at admin at whssocal.org. And lastly, um, our next event um, which kind of ties in with this one is Gabrielle Elman from Brain and Bullish will be showing us how to um, use your personal story to convert colleagues into collaborators. So I encourage you all to join us on January 21st um, at noon for that um, session. And then lastly, um, we encourage you to follow us on social media um, at WHS SoCal. And um, thank you to our sponsor, Cope Preparedness, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone.